الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد Yusuf alayhi salam was in the prison and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for him to stay in the prison as we discussed in the last session until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the king of Egypt a dream and that dream that he was he had the vision that there were seven fat cows being eaten by seven lean ones and there were seven green ears of grain and seven dry ears of grain and the people around the king did not understand and did not know the interpretation of that vision and they called it but a mixed up dreams a man who was with prison he was he was in prison with Yusuf alayhi salam who was the server of the king remembered that there was Yusuf with him in the prison and Yusuf knew the interpretation of dreams because he gave him the glad tiding of his own freedom when he was released from from prison based on the dream that he saw that that service that that servant saw when he was uh, serving wine to the king so he went back to the to the prison and then he called upon Yusuf, Yusuf, O ayyuha siddiq. Yusuf, O you siddiq. And just one of the things that, that we did not stop on the last time is that, that adjective. Asiddiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that description for Yusuf alayhi salam. When is someone called Siddiq? What does Siddiq mean? The hadith, the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ما زال الرجل يصدق ويتحرى الصدق حتى يكتب عند الله صديقا. A man would continue to tell the truth ويتحرى الصدق and be always very vigilant and always seek the truth. Siddiq is someone who would never tell a lie. And he is someone who is always seeking the truth, always seeking the ultimate truth. One of the companions of the Prophet wasallam, who is known as a Siddiq is, of course, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And it is known upon Abu Bakr al-Siddiq that he would not hesitate at all, not for one second, accepting the truth when it comes from the Prophet wasallam. When he believed in the Prophet wasallam, صدقه الذي جاء بالصدق وصدق به That who came with the truth and that who accepted the truth. The one who came with the truth was the Prophet wasallam, and the one that accepted the truth was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu And the Prophet wasallam said in that hadith that everyone who was offered Islam hesitated with it for a moment before accepting it, except Abu Bakr. When he told him, I am the Prophet of Allah, he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah without hesitation. Yusuf alayhi salam, his, his behavior in prison and the way he interpreted the dreams and they came through made, sure, made, made him a siddiq in the eyes of that person. And this is confirmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is someone who never tells a lie. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how he repeated the dream the way it is. Aftina fi sab'i baqarat siman, ya'kuluhunna sab'u nija, wa sab'i sumbulat in khudr, wa ukhara ya bisat khudrin, wa ukhara ya zisat la'alli abji'u ila nasi la'allahum ya'lamun. He repeated the, the, the dream letter per letter. And as we said the last session, Quran is very concise. There is no repetition in Quran unless it is for a very important purpose. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah knows best, could have said, Yusuf ayyuha siddiq affina fi ru'ya al-malik. Tell us about the vision of the king. Without having to repeat it, without having to take almost most of the verse to repeat the same thing that was mentioned two verses back. But Allah is teaching us here that when we transmit a speech, when we transmit any talk, especially when we're asking a fatwa, it has to be transmitted in a very precise and accurate manner. And we said the last time, some of the people that seek fatwa through other people, there may be you know, things that are lost in transmission. If someone you know, concise the fatwa while they're taking it from that person and then resubmitted it in another way to a scholar and then take the answer from the scholar and they go back to that person, you may have a completely different matter. So it is the adab, the manners, the way that we transmit a question, it has to be letter per letter, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us by repeating that question on the tongue of that servant that went to Yusuf alayhi salam with the question. And Yusuf alayhi salam not only gave them the answer to the interpretation of the dream, he added the solution to the problem that is about to face Egypt. He told them that that interpretation of the dream, that Egypt will go through seven years of good harvest and abundant rain. And then after that, there will be seven years of drought and famine. So instead of just interpreting the dream without asking for his freedom, without negotiating anything, just out of his generosity, out of his ihsan, he told them the interpretation of the dream immediately. Qala tazra'un. You know, you see in the Quran when you know how, how well he how well uh, how responsive he was to that, you see the Quran just immediately. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qala tazra'una. Immediately, you will plan seven years, cons consecutively. You will, you will do this, you will have seven good years, and then the, the, then the seven hard years will come. But then he gave them, immediately, the solution to the problem that's about to, to face them. He said, whatever you harvest in that first seven years, you should keep it in its, its ears, you should keep it. And this is one of the best ways to really preserve the grain, is to keep it in the, in the original form because it is preserved in that cover. It is preserved in its own original form of the plant, and the worms that actually eat the grains in the silos cannot get to it, and they will not be able, and the, and the fungus and all of that, the grains will be protected for many years, and that is, these are documented facts. So this is Yusuf alayhi salam with the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell them about the interpretation and the solution. And then he added, more knowledge than the king already had. He said, then after that there will be a year, and that's verse 49, There will be after that a year of abundance, a year of great harvest, a year of a lot of rain, that you will have, you will be able to press your oil and to have your wine and to have everything that, that you missed in those seven years of drought. So he added a proof of prophethood after that. Because the king had, you know, the, the dream of the king did not have this particular glad tiding after that. Yes, seven years, seven good years and seven bad years, and then what? The dream did, you know, did not give us any clue to what comes after that. Yet the prophethood of Yusuf, the knowledge of Yusuf alayhi salam, added to that interpretation of the dream. So when that happened, the king said, bring him to me. And here is Yusuf alayhi salam, after several years in prison, he had two opportunities to be released. The first one is when the servant came to him and asked him about the interpretation of the dream. He could have easily cut a deal. If he easily cut a deal with them, he said, I will tell you the interpretation of the dream after you release me. But that's not the generosity of Yusuf and that's not the nobility of Yusuf. Then came another opportunity a, basically an order from the king, a clear order, you are released. Tuni bihi, just bring him to me, he's a free man. 
Yet Yusuf refused to come out of prison. Because he's a man of dignity. The dignity of the believer. He was put in prison after his name was tainted by the women of the city. After he was tainted as the one who was trying to seduce the wife of the man that hosted him in his own house and raised him as a son. And Yusuf refused to come out of prison with the royal pardon. He said no. And then he said, Go back to your Lord. And then ask your Lord. Ask the Lord meaning the king. What about those women that cut, cut their hands? We know the story. We discussed a few uh, sessions back that, that Yusuf alayhi salam was brought about to the women that were uh, cutting uh, some, uh, that were peeling off some fruit and they were stunned by the looks of Yusuf alayhi salam and the presence of Yusuf and they cut off their hand. They started cutting their hands instead of peeling off the fruit that they had in their, in their hand. Inna Rabbi bikaydihinna Ali, my Lord knows about their plot. Go back to your Lord and ask him what the matter, my Lord already knows what the matter with the plot. I already just on the superiority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over any other king and any other lordship that is about, that's on the face of this earth. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has a hadith that is narrated in Al-Bukhari and Muslim when he said, said, if I stayed in prison, as long as Yusuf stayed in prison, I would answer the call of the man that came to release him from prison. And it is, it is the ulama said, it is the humbleness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's, he's just telling the people that, that, you know, I would have come out of prison. But we have to believe that as well, that he would have come out of prison. Because some people, you know, protested, said, no, Prophet would not come out of prison. If he said he would, then he would. <laughs> okay. We don't negotiate when the, in, with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As-sadiq al You know, there's no, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't tell any lies or exaggerations or anything. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, you know, the highlights. You know, every Prophet had strong points and had certain highlights. And we know the, 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 uh, the, 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 the ultimate perfection came with the Prophet ﷺ, but we should not cut anybody short in their you know, points of strength and, and the, the position that they took uh, ﷺ on certain things. So he said, Yusuf ﷺ, had this position, this situation, I would have, I would have came out of prison, Prophet ﷺ said. But the, Yusuf ﷺ refused to come out before his name is cleared. So goes back to the court of the king, and I think that's where we left it the last session. The king has already, obviously from the, uh, from the storytelling of the Qur'an, has already done his own investigation, and he knew the story of these women. Because the way he started the, the, uh, the interrogation, or if you will, or the court, or the, the trial of, of what is really the fair trial now for Yusuf. Because Yusuf went to prison, Innocent man without being tried for what he has done. And now the king wants to have his own court for Yusuf alayhi salam. Then he said, Ma is rawatunna Yusuf What is the matter with you? What was your affair when you seek to seduce Yusuf? And then the truth came out. Qulna, the women said, now the, the women collectively denied not denied the charge against them. Now this, the truth has to come out. Obviously this, there is no joking around with this king. You know? So the truth has to come out. قُلْنَا حَاشَ no. God forbids. Allah forbids. مَا عَلِمْنَا عَلَيْهِ مِنْ سُوء We have never experienced any evil. We never knew any evil of Yusuf. And now the woman at the heart of the situation comes out. And she said, the woman, the wife of the Aziz, قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ الْعَزِيزِ الْآنَ حَصْحَصَ الْحَقِّ Now the truth is manifest. Now the clear, now the truth is very clear to everyone. أَنَا رَوَتُهُ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ I indeed seduced him. I indeed tried to seek that approach to Yusuf alayhi salam. وَإِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ There is so much, so many 
marks of emphasis in this particular sentence in the Arabic language. Innahu lamina as He is certainly, indeed, truthful. So she leaves no doubt in the mind of anyone that Yusuf is absolutely exonerated from all the charges against him. And then she said, ذَلِكَ لِيَعْلَمَ أَنِّي لَمْ أَخُنْهُ بِالْغَيْبِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي كَيْدَ الْخَائِنِينَ And that is to know, for, for him to know that I have not betrayed him in his absence and Allah will not guide the plot of the betrayal of the of the of the traitors or the betrayers and the the scholars differs differed uh, about the interpretation of this particular verse is who did she not betray she said that's for him to know that it, I did not betray him and who is that person some scholars said it was Yusuf because Yusuf was not in the court where was Yusuf at that when the court was going on he was in prison still, right? He refused to come out of prison. So this, this uh, trial was going on, and Yusuf was not present. So some scholars said so she, he would know that I did not betray him, because she the, betrayed him the first time. Betrayed him in his presence, not in his absence. How did she betray him? When they got to the door, and her husband was at the door, what did she say? What is the punishment for that who wanted harm with your family? She accused Yusuf of, of attacking her. And, and that was not the right, right accusation, obviously. And now she said, and now she is speaking, you see a completely different tone from that woman that was blinded by her desire at that, in the beginning of the story. Now this woman is a believer. Now listen to her. وَاللَّهُ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي كَيْدَ الْخَائِنِينَ Allah does not guide. You know, she is not speaking as the wife of the Aziz. She's speaking as if she is really a believer, almost a follower of Yusuf alayhi salam. So many scholars said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided her heart during those years. And now she is, she is coming back in a, in a completely different manner. And she had no hesitation, you know, in, in witness and given her testimony to the truth. Now, the truth is absolutely manifest, it's clear. And she said what she had to say to exonerate Yusuf. And then she said, so he would know I would not betray him in, in his absence. Some other scholars said that she was speaking about her husband, that she did not betray, actually nothing happened. Nothing actually happened between her and Yusuf. And that is the confirmation of that, is her testimony that actually did not, nothing happened, and there was no betrayal against her husband with Yusuf alayhi salam. And that is because Yusuf was innocent, because the, the verse that follows, she said, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ nafsi." Not that I did not try. I mean, she's reconfirming her guilt. She she for أَنَا رَوَتُهُ عَنْ نَفْسِي I seduced him, and now and she follows, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ nafsi." And I free not myself from the blame. I am to blame. I will take the blame for what, ha for what happened. Now you will see not only a sign of faith and belief in this woman, but a sign of what? Repentance. Right? Repentance. She's, you know, she's coming back. What does tawbah mean? Tawbah means to come back. Literally in the Arabic language. Tawbah wa anab means someone came back. She's coming back. To Allah, and she said, "Wama uvariu nafsi." I will take the blame for this. Inna nafsa la amaratun bissu. Verily, the human self inclines to evil. He said, "That is that I was following my own caprice and my own desires at that time." Illa ma rahim Rabbi. Another clear sign of belief, clean sign of iman, except when my Lord bestows His mercy upon whom He wills. So she is, you know, Allah, this beautiful, uh, beautiful repentance. Stawba nasuha. She said, you know, it, when only, who can only save us from our own desires, from our own caprice, from our own, you know, from our own, the evil that lurks within our souls. And nafs al-ammara, the self that commands evil doing. It's only Allah. So who do we go to to preserve ourselves? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a lot of that you learn from this repenting woman. إِنَّ نَفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُوءِ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي And then she asked for the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ رَبِّي غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Indeed, my Lord is oft forgiving, most merciful. And that's one of the themes of Surah Yusuf. That you will see people that were inclined to do harm. And they did evil things and bad things. But then you see the gates of repentance wide open. And you see that they come back. And when they come back, you, you really like them. You, know, you, you love their repentance. You, you admire their personality. And you see that in the wife of the Aziz. And you will see that with the brother, brethren of Yusuf. Alayhi salam. That you know, no matter what happened, no matter how, how guilty you were, no matter how great your sin is, remember, Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. Never be shy to go back to your Lord. Never hesitate to go back to your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He's always accepting and He can change the heart and He can change the mind. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the king knew. I mean, now it was so clear to that king. First time he said, you know, bring him to me. And he knew that he, was, he, knew he was not dealing with an ordinary person. And now he sees the effect of Yusuf, the innocence of Yusuf, the generosity of Yusuf, the wisdom of Yusuf, the truthful of Yusuf. All of that is now clear and apparent before this king. And obviously that king had some wisdom to recognize that. He said, This is not someone I could pass. Not only bring him to me, bring him to me so I can attach him to my person. So I can use him personally, to help me, to aid me. يَسْتَخْلِصُهُ لِنَفْسِي And then Yusuf was, after he was exonerated, after his innocence was completely clear, now Yusuf comes out of prison. He comes out of prison in dignity, in full honor, in full nobility, as he deserves, alayhi salam. He is the noble, the son of the noble, the son of the noble, the son of the noble. And he is Siddiq, he is truthful, and he was truthful, and yet, you know, one of the most important themes and characteristics of Yusuf alayhi salam is his ihsan. Ihsan is to go above and beyond good deed. You do a good deed which is beautiful, but you beautify it more with ihsan. When he would be asked for something, he would give more. You know, he was, these two prisoners came to him to ask him about interpretation of the dream. What does he give them? Give him da'wah. They gave him their right message. When people come to him with the dream, he interpreted it and he gave him the solution. He is a muhsin, muhsineen. So the king said, لَمَّا كَلَّمَهُ And then when the king had, had actually talked to Yusuf alayhi salam, they had a conversation. Now, he, every time he's given Yusuf a degree up, just look at the, at the sequence of what happened. The first time he hears about his interpretation of the dream, he said, Set him free. You know, let him go out of prison. Bring him to me. He refused, then his innocence is clear. Then he said, bring him to me, astakhlishu li nafsi. And I will, you know, attach him to myself. I will use him in my court. And then when he talked to Yusuf, obviously he, you know, he take him one step up. Not only he would use him in his court, he said, inna kal yawma ladayna makinun ameen. You are with us today, high in rank, and fully trusted. He put him on the top. Made him his wazir, his aziz. You know, you see how it goes up. The, more, the closer he gets to Yusuf, the more he appreciates Yusuf. The more he wants to elevate the rank of Yusuf. <laughs> so Yusuf, alayhi salam, after, you know, he, now he can do whatever he wants, Yusuf, alayhi salam. He said, makinun ami. Makin, tamakkun. You know, you have a strong hold on things. Just wait. You ask, and it will happen. Gave him almost absolute power over one of the wealthiest and strongest nation on the face of the earth at that time. From the depths of the prison to becoming in the highest position in that nation. Imagine that. Subhanallah. And then Yusuf, what did Yusuf say? قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ Yusuf said, set me over 
the storehouses, the treasury of the land. I will indeed guard them with full knowledge. Hafiz, that I'm, I will be trustworthy and I will guard them. I will preserve them. I will manage them well. I will administer right management for them. And then alim, I will do it with knowledge. I'm not going to do it, you know, just... So the two most important qualifications for any job is to be willing and capable, right? So in your hafiz, I will do it. I'm willing to do it. And I'm capable. I have knowledge. How did he have knowledge? Now, of course, he was taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah, Allah gives causes. Allah makes reasons for the things on earth. مُسَبِّبِ الْأَسْبَابِ Right? Where was Yusuf raised? When he was, when he was, bought, when he was bought as a slave in Egypt, he was in the house of who? Aziz. What is the Aziz job? He is over the treasury. Right? So Yusuf was naturally, Allah prepared him for that position. And who would have thought the bought slave of the Aziz would become the Aziz himself one day? after being imprisoned for many years. And Allah has prepared them for this all along, for this job, for this position. Now there are two points here. And we're talking about verse 55. What did Yusuf say? He said, اجعلني على خزائن الأرض. Put me and set me over the treasury. Now he's asking for a position, right? He said, I want to be over the treasury. Put me over the treasury. Now, the ulama said, how would Yusuf ask for a position when the hadith clearly said of the Prophet وسلم, and it's agreed upon, إِنَّا وَاللَّهِ لَا نُوَلِّ هَذَا الْعَمَلَ أَحَدًا سَأَلَهُ That people who ask for a high position, they should not get it. People who seek a position of commandership, they should not get it. You know, people that want, you know, and that's, you know, subhanAllah, exactly the opposite of what we're used to. People just push themselves. To, to get higher. But but how did he, you know, طالب الإمارة لا يأخذها لا يولاها The one who wants the, the, the leadership, that they seek just to be leaders, they seek the leadership for the sake of leadership, they should not be given it. Right? Because they have an alternate motive for it. So, how would Yusuf ask for that? And the second thing, he praised himself. إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ Ali. He said, I am indeed someone that would guard it well and I am all, I have a lot of knowledge. I'm an knowledgeable person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ And do not praise yourself. هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى He indeed knows who has more piety. Of course, that's a trick question. <laughs> you can sell that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said of these verses in, in, you know, said this verse in Surah Yusuf who you can ponder on that. Why is, why is Yusuf's statement is actually the right statement in that particular position? Although on the outward of it, on the appearance of it, it may contradict principles that we, we learn, that we know. First thing, what is he asking for? To be a treasurer. To be a treasurer in times of what? Famine and drought. Now, is that a privilege? <laughs> it's not. You know? He's asking for a very hard job. People resign when, they, when they're faced with things like that. Because they will be faced with sometimes mutiny, rebellions, starving people, people that want to come and, and rob the treasury because you have food and they don't have food. You know, you have hungry nations around you because the drought was not only in Egypt, it was all over. The, the nations. So Yusuf was not, he was asking for a job that is very demanding and it's a hard job. It was not a decoration, it was not a privilege that Yusuf السلام, was ask, asking for. And the ulama said when someone knows that they have the qualification and they know, you know well that they have the qualification for, to be able to serve people, they should come forward. They should not sit back and say, I will not seek a position, you know, I'm humble. They should not do that. If they know that there is a difficult job, there is a task of great importance. People may, if someone comes into this position and they don't know what they're doing, imagine what would happen to, to Egypt in seven years. 
People will die. Children will starve. I mean, it will be a disaster if somebody doesn't know what they're doing and they get themselves into that position. So it was highly appropriate of Yusuf alayhi salam. Number one, to ask for the right position to be put in and yet to show his qualifications as well for that particular job. So people trust that he's not doing that out of just wanting to be, but also they know that he's well qualified for that particular position. And some ulama said that people that hold back and they don't show their qualifications that they know in their heart that they're the best qualified people for that particular job, they are like they're holding their يمنعون الماعون. You know what that verse means? You know, the hold back, aid. You have talent. Allah has given you some certain thing that you're good at. And if you hold it back, that's not humbleness. You have to present it and you have to do the best you, you can. When, when does it, that become a sin? When does that become a show off? It's all about with what? With the intention. With the intentions, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ If people are coming out to show off what they can do, then that's the reward that they're going to get. You know, the first three people that are thrown in the hellfire, this is a very famous hadith, right? A very authentic hadith as well. That the first, when the hellfire opens, and the first three people that will be thrown in the hellfire, who are they? A, a generous person, a knowledgeable person, and a brave fighter. And they will be asked, why did you, why, why, you know, why did you, why did you fight? He said, I fought in the way of Allah. I fought to, he said, no, you fought, the intention was you fought so people can say, he's a brave man. And they said that. Allah give them his reward in dunya. He was known as, you know, the bravest knight of all. But that's that. End of story. He had no reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's thrown in the hellfire. A knowledgeable person, a alim, who would teach the, the words of Allah. And, and he would be asked, why did you do that? He said, for the sake of Allah. He said, no. Allah knows what's in the heart. He said, you did that? So people would say, you're a knowledgeable person. And they did. They said, you're a knowledgeable person. And that's that. You got your reward. And now you have nothing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same thing with the generous people, with a generous person. Allah will say that you did that, so they will say you're generous, and they said that. So it is appropriate to show our qualification. It's okay to write a resume, brother and sister, is what I'm trying to say. You know? And to show your qualifications for a certain job, and we want to be truthful in it. You know, don't exaggerate your resume. Well, that's what it is. You know? And trying to read, to, to get to the job that you think you can do the best at. Don't reach out for things beyond your capability, but if you have capability, don't be shy from reaching out for the best job that you can perform. All of that we learn from these few words in Surah Yusuf. The other thing is, some ulama as well said, and these are all really from the books of Tafsir, that in that particular society, what kind of a society, what kind of, of environment Yusuf was in? A, a Muslim environment or a non-Muslim environment? Non-Muslim environment. A non-believer environment. Would it bring good to the believers and to the non-believers for someone like Yusuf to be in a high position or not? It would, right? It would be best for everyone in that situation if a good person who believes in Allah takes a high position. He will be able to, to protect the believers that could be weakened otherwise. He would be able to spread the message of the Lord. He would be able to, to guide people to the right truth. So in that particular position, it is fine to seek out higher positions. In that particular situation, it is fine, it is allowable, as the scholar said, to seek out positions of leadership. Although Muslims in a Muslim society are discouraged from seeking leadership for the sake of leadership. But in that particular society, to get higher in rank, it gives strength to the believers. You know? And a strong believer is better than a weak believer. So in that particular situation, the scholar said, there is an exception and people should seek out to be in a leadership position 
and they strengthen themselves and they strengthen people around them. And we see that everywhere. I mean, even in private companies and private firms, when you have Muslims in, in positions of leadership, it would be a lot easier for the Muslims that work under them to take an hour off to pray Juma. <laughs> if the boss is a Muslim, right? It would be easier to understand uh, for other people in, at, in the workplace to understand the, the requirement of the religion. That's just one example. At least there would be no discrimination against the believers from the non-believers if, 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 if pe people are in higher positions. So it is fine to seek out those higher positions in these situations. Allah Alaikum. You can, well, that's a different speech. I'll let you do that after. <laughs> of course, he, he made himself a candidate. Yeah, for the treasury. Yes, sir. And he was confirmed. <laughs> so you see Yusuf alayhi salam, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the, the life of Yusuf from being born in the house of Yaqub a very noble position to be. You know, the house of the prophets, the descendants of, of Ibrahim. And then he was tested by adversity. And he was thrown by his own brothers and, and his own brothers down into the depths of the well. And then when he was taken out of the well, it was not really good news because he was sold into slavery. But that, that slavery itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a good thing for him because he was sold into the house of the Aziz of the treasurer of Egypt. And not only he was sold as a slave, what did the Aziz say to his wife? Treat him well. He may be of benefit to us, or we would make him a son for us. So he was not treated as a slave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated him from the depth of the well into the best houses, one of the best houses in Egypt. And then he was tried again by the seduction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. And he was exonerated by what? By the shirt. By a simple torn shirt in the back. Where the, the, the family of the wife of the Aziz herself claimed that if the shirt was cut from the back, then Yusuf is innocent. And his innocence was, was clear. But yet, he was thrown in the depth of the well after the scandal became bigger and the many women in the city wanted to seduce him. So they threw him in prison. Now in the depth of the prison, was prison bad for, for Yusuf alayhi salam? Was him staying in prison bad? If he did not stay in prison, the length he stayed in, he would never come out of prison the way he came out. And the dream would not have been interpreted. And Yusuf would not have been the treasurer. And Egypt would have been lost to drought and famine. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does things. What is the lesson in that? Don't be too happy when prosperity comes to you, meaning don't be too proud and arrogant because you may be tested by it. This may be a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't be too sad when you are tested by hardship and adversity because you don't know where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken you. So when if, if Yusuf saw, thought that the well, the depth of the well was the end of the world, he didn't know that this was his door, his gate, to be in the house of the Aziz. That the prison was his way to become the Aziz himself. To become the highest person in Egypt after the king. And even the scholar said that he was really basically the, the uh, acting king. The king was based, ruling. Think about the, like a situation where you have a monarchy, uh, the democratic monarchy, and then the prime minister. Think of Yusuf as the prime minister. He really does the entire governing. And the king is in the palace, right? as the front for the government. And that's, that was the way that Yusuf was. He was in charge of everything. How do we know that? Because all the decisions that happened in the government after that, you see there's no mention of the king anymore. It's all about the Aziz. All about the Aziz. The Aziz gives that. The Aziz holds. The Aziz loads the, you know, gives the caravans. It's the Aziz. It's Yusuf. He was basically the ruler of Egypt. The actual ruler of Egypt. Alayhi salam. 
So we should learn from the life of Yusuf not to, be, not to get into a state of despair if we are tested with adversity and not to be proud of arrogance if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with uh, prosperity. Allah How much time left? الحمد لله رب العالمين وجاء إخوة يوسف فدخلوا عليه فعرفهم وهم له منكرون and then Yusuf's brothers or brethren came and they entered onto him as the Aziz of Egypt and he recognized them but they recognized him not so the story at this point Yusuf became high in the land Allah سبحانه وتعالى كذلك مكننا ليوسف and so we have given Yusuf the stronghold on the land. Yusuf has been vindicated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has reached a very high position. He was exonerated. His name is cleared. And he holds one of the highest offices in the land. But there were many problems still in the story. There were, what, we, what do they call those? Un, untied ropes or untied ends or, you know, not, not, things, things are still sort of loose out there. Right. What is loose out there? Yaqub alayhi salam is still is still in a state of sadness. Jacob is still in a lot of sadness for the loss of his beloved Yusuf. What other loose ends do we have there? There is a brother for Yusuf. His his brother. His actually his brother from both parents, from his father and mother. He's still in Palestine, being mistreated. By the brothers of by the other brothers of Yusuf, so that brother is also needs some help. What other loose ends are there? The dream has not been interpreted yet. What dream is that? When he saw eleven planets, the sun and the moon are prostrating to him, and yet there is another loose end, one more, that the story has to go and complete. family has not been reconciled. The brothers of Yusuf have not repented yet. <laughs> These are blessed families. These are Al Ibrahim, Al Ishaq, and Al Yaqub. These are families that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلِتُمَّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقِ Right? Allah will have to perfect and complete His bounty. How would God perfect his favor upon a family and there are ten sinners there. They have to repent. They have to be taught a lesson. They have to be, to be brought back. You know, Allah, if Allah loves you, you either come back voluntarily to him if you stray away or he will bring you back. You know, if Allah wants you, he'll either let you come back voluntarily or he'll bring you back. Right? So there, there are ten people out there that are of the blessed family. They are blessed people. They are the children of the Prophet of Allah, Israel. The children of Yaqub. And they are the grandsons of Ishaq. And the great-grandchildren of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. That Allah blessed, said, bless Ibrahim and, and the family of Ibrahim. This is the family of Ibrahim. They will not be left alone. Allah will bring them back. So all of these loose ends here, we will see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now will tell us about that. So the first thing that happens, and you see how concise and beautiful the, the narration of the story is. يوسف, and they came. The brethren of Yusuf came to him. We know already that seven years have passed. We already know that the seven years of good harvest have already gone, and there's some famine in the land, and here's the brethren coming to ask for food. So they entered the court, and here's the Aziz, the treasurer, the governor, the, the control, the one in control, the wazir of Egypt. He's sitting there. And he knew them. He knew their brothers, his brothers. But they did not know Yusuf. Now, they would not, number one, how many years have passed since the time they took their little brother, who was a child, and they threw him in the depth of the well, 
and then the, the time they entered the court of Egypt. How many years at least? Think about that. At least more, you know, let's, let's think about that. Yusuf alayhi salam was a child. And then he was not, you know, by the time the, the seduction happened, Yusuf was a full man, right? Balagha ashuddahu. And many scholars said the word balagha ashuddahu uh, reached the perfection or the completeness of manhood means the age of 40. You know, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَبَلَغَ أَرْبَعِينَ عَامًا It's in the Quran. And even those who said that may not even mean that, at least several years have passed. So let's say seven or eight years at least, minimum, if not more than that. Then how many years did he stay in prison? They said, بِضْعَ سِنِينَ فَلَبِسَ He was in the prison for a few years, and then after the dream of the two servants, he remained for a few years, so at least three to nine after the dream. So many scholars say he spent about nine years in prison. He's, because the Prophet ﷺ in that hadith that we said, وَلَوْ لَبِثْتُ فِي السِّجْنِ مَا لَبِثَ يُوسُفُ If I stayed in prison as long as Yusuf did, that tells you it was not just a year or two. Right? The Prophet is saying it was a long time. Right? So at nine years in prison. And then he, was, he came out of prison and the seven years of drought has already passed. Right? So we're talking about 30 years minimum. And the majority of scholars said mostly 40 years that, that passed. Now, the right, it's really natural for those brothers of Yusuf that threw a small child in the, in the depth of the well, and now they're coming to a court with the ruler is sitting on the throne. They could not even imagine in their wildest dreams and imagination that that's the same boy they threw in the well 30 or 40 years ago. So they, they completely not know, they did not recognize Yusuf alayhi salam. So Yusuf alayhi salam knew, knew them exactly. And then after he uh, gave them the loads for each one of them, the loads of the, of the provision that Yusuf alayhi salam used to, and this is the interpretation of the scholars, that he would give each family a load, a camel's load of food for, for many reasons. And they have to come to be loaded. Each head of the family has to be present to take their provision. So no one would come and say, I represent 200 people and then take that food and then what? Sell it, monopolize it. Y Yusuf was given that food away. So the entire area of Egypt and around Egypt would not suffer through the drought. He was given that food for for a price, actually. We will see that there was a price for it. But it was a very fair price. What does that mean? In times of famine, in times of, of uh, drought and, and lack of resources, what happens to the prices of stuff? It jacks up. And not, not normal people will suffer, even if the food is there. But if it is too expensive, the people will suffer with that. But Yusuf, alayhi salam, would sell the food around Egypt for the same price that the food was before the drought. But for that to be fair and for each family to get their share for that, they will have a camel load for the person that comes for that family. So 10 brothers come and they said, we represent a family and here's our family. We have 11 brothers. And then he said, where is the 11th brother? There's, I see only 10 of you. And this is Al-Qurtubi, by the way. This is where it's coming. Tafsir al-Qurtubi. Uh, and, and I think it's uh, one of the most uh, uh, logical ones to the, 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 that explains how Allah plotted for Yusuf to, to get his brother. So, ten brothers came to Yusuf. They paid for the food, for what the goods they have. They brought with them from, from uh, Palestine or from the desert where they lived. And then they said that there's 11, 11 of us. So he said, where is the 11th one? They said he's with our father. Our father loves Benjamin so much that he hates to send him on a journey with us. And we came to represent that big family of ours. So he said, I will give you a load for that brother, that brother that is absent. But to prove to me that you're telling the truth, next time you come, what do you have to do? You have to bring him. 
I have to make sure that you're not lying to me. Because if every family comes, I mean, it's very logical. If every family says, yeah, there's five of us, but there are two at home, so why don't you give us, you know, seven loads? I said, no, you know, I, I will trust you, I will believe you, but if, if, it, if, you, if, if I find a proof that you're lying to me, what, does, what happens? He said, فَإِن لَمْ تَأْتُونِي بِهِ فَلَا كَيْلَ لَكُمْ عِنْدِي وَلَا تَقْرَبُونَ If you don't come back with him, then you will get no food. لَا كَيْلَ لَكُمْ عِنْدِي You will get no loads of anything. وَلَا تَقْرَبُونَ And don't even come near to me. I will give you that extra camel now. But if you don't prove that you're truthful to me, then you don't come back. And then he said, you know, in the, in the verse before, قَالَ أَتُونِي بِأَخِلْ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَبِيكُمْ Bring that brother that is uh, of your father. أَلَا تَرَوْنَ أَنِّي أُوفِي الْكَيْلِ Don't you see that I actually fulfill the measures? I will give you exact due right for each one of you, including your absent brother. وَأَنَا خَيْرُ الْمُنْزِلِينَ And I am the best of hosts. So he treated them very well. And he hosted them. You see how generous, you know, noble character. I mean, these are the people that threw him in the depth of the well. The exact ten of them. And now they are in his court. He could have easily just like put the chains on. You know, these guys are going to prison. You know, he could have retaliated. He would, but that's not the, these are not the character of prophets. He wants good for them. He doesn't want them to be punished. He wants them to come back to God. He wants them to come back and, and, and be truthfully who they are. The children of prophets. And the descendants of three prophets in a row. So he, he wanted to just teach them and bring them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason I'm saying that, that, that Quran clearly said that he was the best of hosts for them and he treated them well because the Old Testament say that when, he, when they came to him, he put them in prison. And he accused them of spying. And he told them that he will, they will be released and, and the proof of their innocence that they're not spies if they bring the 11th brother in. And, and so there is differences here in the two stories. Because Quran clearly says, Allah clearly says that he was the best host for them. So they were treated well. And khairul munzilin, and being in prison does not really, you know, doesn't come together. It's impossible. the Torah that, that is in the hands of the people of the book right now. So Yusuf alayhi salam wanted to get his brother. And he wanted to make sure, so first, first thing that he did is he told them, if you don't bring him back, you're not going to get any food, you're not going to get any loads. And not only I will not give you that 11th load, I will not give you any loads at all. None of you will get anything. But yet he wanted to even seduce them more and make it more tempting for them to bring his, his brother. So look what he did. And this is how Allah plots. You know, Allah plots something. They will, it's a perfect plot. There will be no way that this plot would not work. And then he said, وَقَالَ لِفِتْيَانِهِ اِجْعَلُوا بِضَاعَتَهُمْ فِي رِحَالِهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَعْرِفُونَهَا إِذَا انْقَلَبُوا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ And Yusuf told his servants to put their money, the money, the goods that they brought to buy those loads of food, he said, put it into their bags. Put it back in their bags and the loads. Because who loads the camel? The servants of Yusuf. They load the people and they send the camels back with these people. He said, put that, their, their money, their goods that they gave us, everything that they brought, put it back in there. That serves multiple reasons. Number one, it tempts them. See how generous this man is? You know, he's very trustworthy. He doesn't even want our money. Why wouldn't, he, why wouldn't we trust him to bring our brother back? You know? The other thing is, he was also concerned that maybe they'll go home and they may not have more money they, they can bring back. They may not have the price for the second load. So to guarantee, to absolutely guarantee that they're coming back with their brother, he gave them their money back. So they know that he knows that they have the, the, what it takes for them to come back and buy more food. And then they went to their father. And then, فَلَمَّا رَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَبِيهِمْ قَالُوا يَا أَبَانَا مُنِعَ مِنَّا الْكَيْءِ فَأَرْسِلْ مَعَنَا أَخَانَا نَكْتَلْ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ They came excited to their father and they said, Oh, my, our father, they, we, we, 
no more, no more measure of grain we shall get unless we take our brother. We cannot bring any more food. Look at all the food that we brought. Well, we can't bring any more unless we take our brother. And he was obviously holding back his brother. Now he's more connected to Benjamin for two reasons. He's beloved to him. You know, how do we know that Benjamin was beloved, was more beloved than the other ten? From the Quran. Looking at the Hafiz. What in the beginning of the surah? Yusuf wa akhuhu ahabu ila abina minna. Yusuf and his brother are more beloved to our father than us. So Binyamin was already favorite, one of the favorite sons to his father, even before the whole story starts. And now after Yusuf was lost, he was the only one left. So imagine how, how tight Yaqub is holding on to his son Binyamin. He would never let him go. The first time he let Yusuf go, would he let now his, his other son Binyamin go? No way. No way he will let Binyamin go. And then they immediately said, he said, we will get no food. You know, it's a matter of life and death now. فَأَرْسَلْ مَعَنَا أَخَانَا And send our brother with us. نَكْتَلْ We will get the loads, we will get the food. وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Again, إِنَّا وَلَامْ And then the L that comes, the lamb that goes into حَافِظُونَ This is for absolute emphasis twice. We certainly, indeed, we promise, we will keep, we will preserve him, we will take care of him, we'll protect him. And then he said, هَلْ آمَنُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا كَمَا أَمِنْتُكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَخِيهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ Would I trust you? Would I, I, would I tr- entrust him to you except that I entrusted his brother, Yusuf, before? He said, I know the kind of protection and the kind of care that you give. You know? I can't trust you. لَا يُلْدَغُ الْمُؤْمِنُ مِنْ جُحْرًا مَرَّتَيْنِ The believer will not be bit from the same hole twice. He said, I have already been bitten once with you. Like I trusted you with Yusuf. And now you want the other one. And then he said the protection, you know, to say that. And then he, he just said these, these words. And then he says, فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ The protector, the actual protector. So for people, for us and for him and for his brothers and the sister and nobody to understand that when we, we protect something, Allah is the protector. We, we, t- we do our part in preservation, in protection. You know, we take all the precautions that we need to take. But the true protector, we have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time we fulfill the hadith, You tie up your camel, but then you have to rely on Allah. That knot is not going to protect your camel from being stolen or lost. It's Allah that is protecting. But your job is to do what you can. Do your part. So that's what he's saying. No, you're not taking Benjamin with you. You're not taking Benjamin. But I'm not seeking your protection to him. Allah is the protector. And he is the most merciful. Yaqub is, uh, Allah described him later on, he's a very knowledgeable prophet of Allah. He has this connection with Allah. Almost every time you see a quote from Yaqub alayhi salam, the word Allah has to be in it. In the, entire, in the entire verse. Always mentioning Allah. Always mentioning, always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu khayrun hafidhan. Wa huwa arhamur rahimin. So they started unpacking. They tried. They, see that tells you the excitement. So subhanallah. Just the, 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 the storytelling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gives you the details in very, very few words. From just knowing that they did not unpack till after they talked to their father, just tells you the excitement they were in coming home and telling their father about the deal. And you know, you have to do this. And you have to, they haven't even pack, unpacked yet. They haven't opened their, their uh, bags, if you will, or, or, or luggage yet. And then started unpacking. You know, they talked to their father. Father said no. وَلَمَّا فَتَحُوا مَتَاعَهُمْ وَجَدُوا بِضَاعَتَهُمْ رُدَّتْ إِلَيْهِمْ Now the plot of Allah and Yusuf is working. So he was concerned that, you know, even to, to just tell them there would be no food may not only work. And it didn't work. It didn't work with Yaqub alayhi salam. But now they started unpacking. They found the money has returned to them. Their goods are back. And then they went back to the father. They said, Father, Ya Abana ma nabghi, what more do we want? هذه بضاعتنا ردت إلينا. Here is our money. Here is our goods. It's back to us. 
you know, we're dealing with a very generous person. We will protect him. Why, why would we not bring Benjamin back? You know, why would we not bring him back? And, you know, they started convincing their father. They said, listen. هَذِهِ بِضَاعَتُنَا رُدَّتْ إِلَيْنَا وَنَمِيرُ أَهْلَنَا وَنَحْفَظُ أَخَانَا وَنَزْدَادُ كَيْلَ بَعِيرُ They said it's a very simple equation. We have our money back and we will نَمِيرُ أَهْلَنَا نَمِيرُ أَلْمِيرَ is food. نَمِيرُ أَهْلَنَا is we will feed our families, you know. He said our father consider all these hungry people around you. Don't be, you know. And then, وَنَمِيرُ أَهْلَنَا وَنَحْفَظُ أَخَانَا We will protect our brother. That's the second time they emphasize it. وَنَزْدَادُ كَيْلَ بَعِيرُ And we will have an extra load. You know? ذَلِكَ كَيْرٌ يَسِيرُ It is almost a no-brainer. They're saying, you know, why would we not take Benjamin with us? ذَلِكَ كَيْلٌ يَسِيرُ It is an easy thing to figure out. An easy measure. An easy quantity. We should do this. So after all of that argument and, and Yaqub saw the generosity of the treasurer of Egypt and they have the money and they have the goods and all they need to do is go back and get more. You know, it's really a simple deal. So Yaqub said, قَالَ لَنْ أُرْسِلَهُ معكم. I will not send him with you. He's still holding tight. حَتَّى unless تُؤْتُونِ مَوْثِقًا مِنَ الله, That you will bring me a solemn oath on Allah's name. Now these are believers. And we have to understand, you know, these are not people who would bring Allah. You see, and that tells us what? That for a believer, to bring Allah's name in vain, what a big deal that is. You know, I mean, these people were, were, were ready, you know, they threw these brothers of Yusuf, they threw him in the depth of the well. But he knew if he brings the name of Allah, that, that they understand the enormity of this. That the name of Allah cannot be used lightly. He said, حَتَّى تُؤْتُونِي مَوْثِقًا مِنَ اللَّهِ That you have to give me a solemn oath in Allah's name. That you will bring him to me. إِلَّا يُحَطَ بِكُمْ He gave him an exception. Unless you are yourself surrounded by enemies. Unless you, you, you're really overwhelmed and helpless and you cannot do it. So your intention has to be very strong that you will bring your brother back unless it would be absolutely impossible for you to do that. And then they agreed to do that. They really had full intention. They had no evil intentions towards ben Benjamin As they said, فَلَمَّا آتَوْهُ مَوْثِقَهُمْ They gave him his, they swore their solemn oath. قَالَ اللَّهُ He re-emphasized, اللَّهُ عَلَى مَا نَقُولُ وَكِيلُ Allah is the witness to what we have said. So he, they brought, bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala twice. He leaves them no way. Meaning if they did not fulfill their oath, they have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he gives them the, the highest oath possible. And then he send them on their way. And then he asked them something. It's a very, very nice gesture from a parent who's so concerned. A father who was so concerned for the safety of his children. And he said, قَالَ يَا بني. He loves them all. لَا تَدْخُلُوا مِنْ بَابِ الْوَاحِدِ وَادْخُلُوا مِنْ أَبْوَابٍ مُتَفَرِّقَةٍ وَمَا أُغْنِي عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَعَلَيْهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ I said, O oh my son, do not enter the city from one gate, but enter by different gates. gates. And I cannot avail you against Allah at all. Verily, the decision rests only with Allah. In Him I put my trust. And let all those who that trust put their trust in Him. So what is he telling them now? He said, when you enter that city, the capital of Egypt, don't enter as one caravan. Why is that? Right, right. I got the two answer, the right answer. The, the ulama said there are two, two uh, possible uh, answers for this, for the way that Yaqub alayhi salam wanted his children to come in different, from different gates. Number one, they will not be seen and again, the 11 young, strong people coming into, into that one town. So people may be scared of them, may be afraid, may, be think, may think that they're up to no good because that's the wealthy town and everything around it is hungry, right? And it may be a target for people that want harm with the town. They may be spies, they may be, you know, the, the forefront for a coming army or something like that. 
So do not, so when they come from different doors, they don't bring attention to themselves. And the other thing is, was that the 11 brothers together to one family, that may bring the evil eye. That may, may bring envy towards that family. And he wanted to repel envy. And these are the two explanations there are in the books of Tafsir. But yet with that, he said that, that, that these precautions that you're taking and not coming, that will not change Allah's fate and Allah's destiny and Allah's qadr. Although that, that I'm advising you to do this, you have to understand that this will not change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preordained for you. وَمَا أَغْنِي لَكُمْ عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِشْئِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ Indeed, all the ruling, all the judgment, all the decision rests only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتْ I rely and I put my trust in Allah and all should put trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and practice true tawakkul. So anytime we do anything, you know, you lock your house door, you don't think that that lock is keeping you safe. Allah is keeping you safe, but you have to lock the door. When you get sick and you take a pill, don't think that that pill is the cause for your cure. Allah is curing you. And the pill is the cause that Allah made for the cure. When you go to a physician, don't, don't think that that physician has the cure in their hand. Allah has the cure. But Allah made causes, made reasons, how you should seek it and how you should do it. And this is what Yaqub is saying. You know, this is a great lesson in tawakkul. This is a great lesson to understand what tawakkul means. What relying on Allah means. It doesn't mean that he said, Allah is my, prote- Allah, is my uh, Allah will provide my provision, and I'm just going to sit at home. You know? Allah doesn't say that. You have to do, you have to put your effort, you have to do your best, and rely on Allah. Because your provision is not coming because of your work. It's coming because Allah has ordained it for you. And Allah is providing for you. But you cannot sit at home and say, my provision will come to me, because Allah ordained it for me. So this is what Yaqub said. Come from different doors, but don't think that that will change anything that, from what Allah has ordained for you. And the protector, what he just said in the, in the previous verse, Allahu khayrun hafiza, wa huwa arhamur rahimin. Allah is the only protector. This will not protect you, but that's something that you do to, you know, to, to do your part, to fulfill your part in this situation. So they obeyed their father. وَلَمَّا دَخَلُوا مِنْ حَيْثُ أَمَرَهُمْ أَبُوهُمْ and when they entered the way their father said, Ma Allah emphasizes, Allah confirms that. Ma kana yughni anhum min Allahi min shayi. This would not have changed anything that Allah has ordained for them. This would not have changed the destiny. It would not have changed anything. What would it, what happened here? Illa hajatan fi nafsi Yaqub qabaha. It is actually a need in the inner self of Yaqub which he has discharged and fulfilled. You know, it makes you feel better to do your part. And it made Yaqub feel better. He's, you know, he's a human being. He's a concerned father that has already lost a son. And now things are not smelling too good for him. This whole situation must have been smelling a little fishy for Yaqub. And he's reluctantly letting his beloved Benjamin go. And now he just wants to add a layer of protection. But he is his tawakkul, his reliance is only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنَّهُ لَذُوْ عِلْمٍ لِمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ And he is indeed, he is endowed with knowledge. Allah has given Ya'qub a lot of knowledge. Allah, Allah is saying Ya'qub is not doing these things out of superstition. You have to understand that. It's important for us. And Allah is emphasizing that in the Quran. Ya'qub was not superstitious when he said enter from different, he is knowledgeable. Prophet, وَإِنَّهُ لَذُوْ عِلْمٍ لِمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ Allah is saying that in a very uh, confirmatory way. He is indeed endowed with knowledge that is, that is coming from Allah for what we have taught him. Allah has taught him. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But most, most men, most people, do, they know not. So I think, inshallah, we will stop at this point because for the for the sake of the actual story, uh, now we're leaving the brothers of, yeah, of brothers of Yusuf and the children of Yaqub on their second journey to Egypt. There'll be more journeys after that. But this is their second journey, the first time they went to Egypt, they got the loads, and they got the load for Dwin Yamin, and now they're coming back with their brothers to show to the Aziz, 
and to show the Aziz that they were truthful and to show that they have a